Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to provide you with another update as to what's happening in the Russian economy, and specifically to talk about continued attacks against Russian oil refineries that have taken place over the weekend of the presidential election in Russia. And these attacks have brought a furious reaction from President Putin, who now claims that Ukraine are trying to damage the presidential elections. Now, I'm not sure if you've been following what's going on in terms of those elections, but I think it's almost 1000% sure that President Putin is going to win that election. There is very little doubt in anybody's mind that anybody else has got a sporting chance here. And in fact, what I'm going to do in this video is ask you the question as to whether or not you can name any of the other three candidates that are standing against President Putin. We're sitting around eight months away from the US election, and I'm sure that most people in the world could tell you that that election is taking place between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. But we've got Russia, one of the other superpowers in the world, who've got an election going on right now. And I would bet that there are very few people outside of Russia who can name any of the other candidates. So I'll talk through those candidates later in today's video, see if you can get even close to any of their names. But in terms of the details of today's video, what I want to talk about are two more refineries that have now been hit in Russia. And one of these refineries is located around 900 miles from the Ukrainian border. So this is a very long range strike that Ukraine have organized. And what we've got now is continued pressure on the Russian authorities in terms of the loss of these refineries, the closure of these facilities, and the risk that they're running in terms of every single one of the refineries that are within about a thousand kilometers of the Ukrainian border now being in range of being attacked. So we'll go through the details of the latest two strikes. And this means that Ukraine have now hit six oil refineries in the last six weeks, and they're really ramping up their efforts. So we'll go through the details of the refineries that have been hit, how many barrels of oil per day they're processing, and what that means in terms of lost income from Russia's point of view, and what the potential lost income would be if these refineries were actually put out of action for up to 12 months. And it would be absolutely huge, the impact on Russia's economy. We'll then talk about what the impact of these attacks have been on Russian fuel prices, because there has been a huge increase in the price of fuel in Russia over the last few weeks. And these increases in fuel prices now have the potential to have a huge impact on Russian inflation, which is already an ongoing problem for the Bank of Russia and the Russian economy. We'll then talk about what's going on in the Russian election. And then finally, today I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think the impact of these ongoing attacks against Russian oil and gas infrastructure will be on the Russian economy and what's likely to happen over the course of the next three to six months. But before we get started on all of that, let's say once again, thank you so much to everyone that's supporting the channel. If you've bought me a coffee or sent me a YouTube super thanks over the last week, thank you for the time and effort that you've taken to do that. I really appreciate every single one of those. And if you've signed up either as a Patreon or a YouTube member or a Buy Me A Coffee member, thank you for your long-term support. It really helps me to keep the channel going and posting more videos like this. On Saturday the 16th of March, it was reported that two more oil refineries in Russia have been struck by Ukrainian drone attacks. This map of Russia and Ukraine shows the distance between the Ukrainian border and the Russian oil refinery located in Sizran. And as you can see here, the distance of this drone strike is over 1,100 kilometers, which is more than 700 miles, which makes this one of the longest range drone strikes that Ukraine has successfully managed to achieve so far. And I think what's interesting about the location of this strike is that it is right in the heart of Russia. This drone would have had to fly predominantly over Russian territory. So the Russian authorities and the Russian military would have had a long time to be able to detect this drone and potentially shoot it down. And obviously they were unable to do that because the strike was successful. And this really highlights the vulnerability that Russia now has in terms of all of the oil refineries that are located less than 800 miles from the Ukrainian border because drones are now very much in range for these facilities. It was reported that on Saturday the 16th of March, a petroleum product processing unit at the Rosneft PJSC oil refinery in Sizran caught fire after a drone strike. The plant's design capacity is 8.5 million barrels per year or around 170,000 barrels per day. It was reported that the area of the fire in Sizran reached 500 square meters or around 5,400 square feet 
Workers were evacuated and no casualties were reported. A second drone attack was reported at the Slavyansk on Kuban oil refinery in the southern Russian region of Krasnodar. A fire was reported to have broken out of the facility, which has subsequently been extinguished, and one person was reported to have died of a suspected heart attack. And this map shows the location of that second oil refinery. And as you can see, it's in a completely different part of Russia. It's actually in the southern part, which is close to the annexed area of Crimea, which Russia annexed from Ukraine back in 2014. And I think what this highlights is that the Ukrainian drone attacks are not focused on one specific region. They are spreading these attacks around. So from Russia's point of view, it becomes very difficult to be able to defend against that because you don't know where these facilities are going to be hit. It literally could be anywhere in Russia. And that, of course, is a challenge from Russia's point of view because they can't just deploy all of their defense systems in one region when different facilities are being hit on the same day. And this table shows the seven largest oil refineries that Russia has confirmed have been attacked so far by Ukrainian drones. And the reason I wanted to show this table is really to highlight the volume of oil that these oil refineries are processing on a daily basis. The largest facility that's been hit so far is the Sergat Karishi refinery, which processes 420,000 barrels of oil per day. And when you annualize that figure, this means that the facility is processing 153 million barrels of oil per year. And when you consider that the price of a refined barrel of oil, so gasoline, diesel, kerosene, is a minimum of $100 per barrel, that means that this facility is producing around $15 billion worth of refined products every year from Russia's point of view. So that is obviously a lot of revenue. Now, in terms of the damage that's been inflicted on this facility so far, there have only been partial strikes, so the whole facility has not been fully closed down. But you can see why Ukraine is really targeting these facilities, because if it was to have successful strikes on the heart of the refining process, and it had to shut down and potentially remain closed for a prolonged period of time, it would have a crippling impact on Russia's economy, because it would be losing a huge amount of income. The second largest facility that's been successfully attacked so far is Rosneft's refinery at Ryazan, which was hit on March the 13th. And this facility processes 343,000 barrels of oil per day, which on an annualized basis is 124 million barrels of oil. And as you can see, the attacks that took place this week have meant that Russia have had to reduce the output of this facility by 50,000 barrels of oil per day. So that means at around $100 per barrel, they're losing $5 million of revenue every single day that this facility remains affected. And as we've talked about many times before, Russia currently has a problem in terms of its lost access to expertise because companies such as ExxonMobil, BP and Shell have all cut their relationships with Russia. They've lost access to technology and they've also lost access to capital. So in terms of fixing these problems, it isn't just a case of sending a couple of engineers down with a couple of spanners to put things right. This is going to be a major task. So these facilities could be impacted for months or potentially even longer than that. So when you're thinking of $5 million per day, every day, if this facility was affected for the next 12 months, that would mean a loss of income of over $1.8 billion. The third largest facility that's been hit recently was Lukov's Nizhny Novgorod refinery, which was hit on the 12th of March. And that facility produces over 340,000 barrels of oil per day, which again on an annualized basis is around 124 million. And as you can see, the attack this week has taken out around 60,000 barrels of oil per day capacity. So that means that the impact of the recent attack is a $6 million per day loss of revenue. So if the impact of the recent strike was to last for 12 months, that would mean a loss of revenue of around $2.2 billion. And if we now take a step back and look at the total capacity of these seven oil refineries, it's over 2 million barrels of oil per day, which on an annualized basis is more than 730 million barrels of oil per year. And so if these facilities were to be hit with more drone strikes and were closed for a period of 12 months, that would mean a loss of income from Russia's point of view of more than $73 billion. And of course, these are only seven facilities. Russia has 44 mega refineries and Ukraine has the intention of trying to attack all of them. And if it was to have successful strikes on the majority of those facilities, it would have a devastating impact on Russia's income and the Russian economy. 
The recent attacks on oil refineries in Russia is now starting to have a hugely negative impact on the price of fuel for Russian consumers. This chart shows the movement in the wholesale price of gasoline and diesel in Russia over the last 12 months. The movement in the gasoline price is shown by the black line and the movement in the diesel price is shown by the yellow line. And the scale on the right hand side of the chart shows the price for one metric ton of each of these fuels. So if we focus in on the price of gasoline, because I think that's the most interesting trend here, we've got three distinct phases in terms of the movement in price over the last 12 months. In the period between March and September 2023, there was a pronounced increase in the price of gasoline. In the middle of March, one metric ton was trading for around 50,000 Russian rubles. However, by the middle of September, that price had increased to around 77,000, which represents an increase over that period of around 35%. And that was broadly in line with what was happening with oil prices globally. The price of oil moves up and down depending on supply and demand. And global oil prices had been rising as a result of OPEC Plus's announcements that they were cutting back on production and also a general increase in demand for oil on hopes that the Chinese economy was going to have a good finish to 2023. From the middle of September 2023 to the start of January 2024, the price of gasoline in Russia fell significantly from 77,000 rubles per tonne to around 42,000, which represents a fall of around 45%. And once again, this was broadly in line with what was happening in the global markets, as we saw a slowdown in the global economy and concerns started to rise about the economy in China, oil prices fell. But what we can see from the final part of this chart is that from the middle of January through to the middle of March, there has been a significant increase in the price of gasoline in Russia, rising from around 42,000 rubles to the current level of around 63,000, which represents an increase over the last two months of around 50%, which is significantly higher than the movement in global oil prices. And this now is as a result of what's happening in terms of supply and demand in Russia. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that Russia has announced two major production cuts over the last 12 months. The first was in 2023, when it announced that it was cutting back on 500,000 barrels of oil production per day. It then followed that up with a recent announcement saying that it was going to cut back a further 471,000 barrels of oil per day. And in addition to that, Russia has also announced a six-month ban on the export of oil gasoline. And the reason that Russia is doing this is because of the production problems that are happening right now in the country, which means that it's got less gasoline that it can produce. And therefore, we've now got a movement in terms of the dynamic between demand and supply. Demand has remained at the same level in Russia, but supply is going down. And simple economics tells you when you get a situation like that, prices start to go up. And that's exactly what we're seeing from this chart. And that obviously is bad news for Russia because it's going to drive up inflation because the price of fuel feeds into the price of everything. So that will start pushing prices up. And also in terms of Russian consumers, it means that fuel is now more expensive and that's going to put pressure on their budgets, which is obviously bad news from all of those consumers' point of view. In addition to the Ukrainian attacks on oil refineries in Russia, it's now been reported that Ukraine has been targeting the town of Belgorod, which is relatively close to the Ukrainian border. And this is the first time that we've seen Ukraine taking the war to Russia, actually hitting cities in Russia with attacks, not just on oil and gas facilities, but just causing chaos and fear and issues within the Russian society. And obviously from President Putin's point of view, this is something he is extremely unhappy about because up until now, the war in Ukraine has been deemed to be a special military operation that really shouldn't have any impact on the daily lives of Russians. But when explosions start happening in cities in Russia, that is a major problem. This map shows the location of Belgorod, and as you can see, it's only around 50 miles from the Ukrainian border, so really close. And on March the 15th, which was the first day of the presidential elections in Russia, it was reported that multiple explosions took place in Belgorod, and Russian air raid sirens were sounded across the city, forcing people who were attending polling stations to vote in the presidential election to go into air raid shelters. Russia's defence ministry announced that its air defence systems had intercepted and destroyed two Grad shells and five drones over the city, and later announced that seven more rockets from Vampire multiple rocket launcher systems were intercepted. 
The governor of Belgorod in a Telegram post said that two people in the region had been killed as a result of the attacks. And as a result of these attacks, it's been announced that schools in the region will be closed on Monday and Tuesday, the 18th and 19th of March. And shopping malls will be closed on Sunday and Monday, the 17th and 18th of March. So at the start of today's video, I set you the challenge of trying to name one of the candidates in the Russian election that isn't Vladimir Putin. Well, just in case you're still trying to guess, this picture shows you the three candidates that are officially standing against President Putin. The first of these is Nikolai Karatinov, a 75-year-old senior member of the Communist Party who's been a deputy of the state of Duma, the lower parliament's house, since 1993. He actually ran in the presidential election in 2004, coming second to President Putin with 13.7% of the vote. The second candidate is Vladislav Davankov, a 40-year-old state Duma deputy from the New People Party and is the youngest candidate and only five years over the minimum age of 35 to run for president. He's a former businessman who casts himself as a relative liberal and has criticised the government crackdown on the media and freedom of expression, saying it mimics Soviet-era repression and has called for easing state pressure on business. He's also suggested that he supports peace talks with Ukraine, but on Russian terms with no rollback, meaning that Russia would not cede territory that it has occupied. Previously, Devankov ran for the role of mayor of Moscow in 2021, coming in fourth with 5.3% of the vote. The third and final candidate is Leonard Slutsky, who's 56 and chairman of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. Slutsky has been a State Duma secretary since 1999, and in that role has actively supported President Putin's foreign policy, including the invasion of Ukraine. In 2018, several female journalists accused him of sexual harassment, which he denied. So there we have the full list of candidates that are running against President Putin. Now, it's very, very, very unlikely that any of them will get a meaningful percentage of the vote. President Putin is extremely likely to win by a landslide victory. And hats off to you if you were able to name any of those three, because I wasn't, and I'm looking into these things on a daily basis. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I think the ongoing attacks by Ukraine on Russian oil and gas facilities located in Russia is a key change in the way that this war is playing out. Up until now, Russia has been the dominant force. They have been winning this war, and it's likely that they will continue to focus a lot of money and time and effort on maintaining the occupied territory and keeping Ukraine back in terms of all of the areas of fighting. And as I've spoken about before, Ukraine is currently waiting for a new wave of funding. It needs more aid, it needs more money, it needs more military support. And that's being held up in the USA right now. So Ukraine is really on the back foot in terms of what's happening on the ground in its own land. But the new tactic of hitting Russian oil and gas infrastructure is really quite a smart move from Ukraine's point of view, because you don't have to be dominant to be able to cause major chaos. As long as you've got these drones that can fly unmanned, so you're not even putting any of your personnel at risk, you can fly these things hundreds of miles, as we've seen in today's video, and hit oil and gas facilities. And the issue that Russia has is firstly, it doesn't know where these attacks are coming from because they're random. They're hitting different facilities on different days, sometimes different facilities on the same day. Secondly, it's quite difficult to intercept these drones because they're relatively small and they're flying relatively fast. So it's difficult to be able to just pick them off. Russia is intercepting a lot of the drones, but all it takes is one of these things to get through. And some of these drones are loaded with up to 50 kg of explosives, which is enough to take out a tank. So if that hits one of these facilities, it's going to cause major problems because you've got a lot of combustible products on site. So obviously it's not just the explosives themselves that are gonna cause damage. If everything on site catches fire, then you've got widespread problems. And as we've talked about both in today's video and previous videos, some of these fires are widespread and difficult to put out and causing damage. And from Russia's point of view, the last thing that they want at the moment is having to fix their refineries because Russia has lost its contacts. It's no longer dealing with the oil majors, so it doesn't have that level of expertise to be able to fix things. It's also lost access to technology as a result of the sanctions, and it's also lost access to capital. The last thing that Russia wants to do right now is divert lots of money into rebuilding its oil refineries. 
but also the impact on the local economies is going to be huge because if you get a strike at your facility and you have to close it down, even if it's just for a week or two weeks, that means that you're going to have all those employees either being laid off for that two week period, not being paid, or you're going to have to keep paying all of those people and you're not getting the income because you've had to close the facility. And when you're talking about oil and gas infrastructure, we are talking about a business that's got a very high fixed cost base because you have to keep everything running 24 seven. That's how these things operate. You have huge volumes of oil coming in, you process those huge volumes, and then you ship them out, sell them and get the money in. Now, if you have a delay to that process, it means firstly, you're not taking the huge volume of oil in. So that causes Russia a problem in terms of it's pumping all of this crude oil out of the ground. And the Russian system is geared up to send millions of barrels of crude oil every single day to all of these refineries. So when you get closures, that causes Russia a problem because if it can't send it to those refineries, it's going to have to put it somewhere else or cut back on the production. Now, in terms of sending it somewhere else, it's not quite as easy as just putting it onto ships and sending it over to India and China because you have to schedule those ships. All of the ships that are coming in and going out from the Russian ports are booked in for the next few months. So everything is lined up to cope with the current level of production. So when you have a problem with the refineries, which means that the crude can't go to those refineries, you can't just simply put it onto ships. So the only other option that Russia will have will be to try to cut back on the production, to actually squeeze the production down so less oil is coming out of the ground. And I don't think it's coincidental that these attacks are taking place at the same time as Russia has announced another cutback of 500,000 barrels of oil per day. It's probably doing that because it doesn't have anywhere to send that oil because we've got problems with the refineries. So that's a big problem in terms of the big picture from Russia's point of view. But also, if you think about what's happening at those refineries, if you do close down and people are made redundant or told to go home for two weeks or three weeks or a month or more, then that means that those people are not being paid and that will have a domino impact on that local area because if those people don't have any money, they're not spending it at the store, the store isn't making any money. And so you have that multiplier effect in reverse. It quickly hits the local economy. And so what we're seeing here is Ukraine changing its tactics, deciding that the best way to go on the offensive is to hit Russia where it hurts in its pocket to try to damage the oil and gas industry so that it reduces Russia's income. And ultimately, that will have the biggest impact out of anything that Ukraine can do. It might win some ground in terms of winning battles, but that's not going to win the war. President Putin has made it very clear that Russia is unlikely to retreat and it is not going to concede anything in this war. So the only way that some sort of conclusion will be brought to this conflict is if Russia has a huge loss of income, if it's hemorrhaging cash as a result of its oil and gas facilities burning all over the country. That is the only way that I think President Putin will come to the negotiating table and try to agree some form of peace settlement. So the change in tactics by Ukraine looks like a smart move. It's already having an impact on Russia's income. It's likely as more of these attacks occur that it's going to have a bigger and bigger impact. And ultimately, I think that's one of the ways that this war may come to an end. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode. You found it useful, informative, and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.